Ephesians 6, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 9 together this morning. I do want to invite you to stand as we read God's word together. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. This is the word of God according to the Apostle Paul. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and we are so grateful and thankful for your grace and mercy. We thank you for saving us, for calling us to yourself through faith in Christ, for making us new, for making us a new people with new life, with new purpose. Father, with new desires. And ultimately, our desire is to glorify you, to worship you, to praise you, and to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Lord, we gather as your people this morning to do just that. Uh, our gathering for worship is an expression of our love and devotion to you. We set aside this time every week that we might gather to encourage one another in the gospel, that we might lift our voices together in unity, in song, Father, in prayer. And Lord, as we come before your throne in prayer even now, we we do so with many things on our minds, many stresses and anxieties. Father, various responsibilities and things that we must accomplish, things that are weighing on our minds from last week, things that weigh on our mind for the week to come. Father, we praise you that you are the sovereign God who knows the end from the beginning, and therefore you know each and every thought. You know each and every care and concern. And because you have loved us so greatly in Christ, you call us in your word to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. You call us to lay our burdens at your feet and, and trusting our situations and circumstances to you as a faithful creator who is guiding and leading and wielding all of your omnipotent power to make us like Jesus. And Father, we thank you for that. So Lord, as we gather for worship, we pray that you would anchor our hearts to the hope that we have in Christ, that you would empower us to lay down these burdens and cares that we might focus in on your word and, and hear you speaking to us very plainly from your word. We thank you that every time we open this book, you are speaking. That it is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. That your word will accomplish everything for which you send it forth. And Lord, we pray that as we gather and worship under the word now, that you would have your way that you would open our hearts to be receptive to the truth, that you would work in us obedience to the word, that we might apply it to our lives and live it out and glorify you and display Christ, his glory, his love, his gospel in the world by both our words and by our way of living. So Father, help us now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. There are times when we read something in one of the letters of the New Testament, and due to the significant gap in both time and culture, we are left a little bewildered by the text. 
The text sometimes leaves us, at least initially, with more questions than answers. And I think in some ways this morning's text is like that. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been making our way through this household code that the Apostle Paul gave to the Christians in Ephesus. He first addressed husbands and wives. Last week, we walked through his exhortation to children and parents. And this week, we're going to unpack Paul's instructions for Christian slaves and Christian masters. That last sentence in and of itself is enough to cause us to scratch our heads. We find the institution of slavery so reprehensible, and rightly so, that we read texts like this one, and we ask ourselves, can there even be such a thing as a Christian slave master? That sounds like an oxymoron. We'll deal with that issue shortly, but first let's walk through the text together. I want to put the context in front of us again. Paul has been using this language about walking ever since Ephesians 4.1. It's that main theme of the second half of the book. He spent the first three chapters laying out the doctrine of the gospel, what it is, what Christ has done for us, the beautiful, glorious realities of our faith in Jesus. And then starting in chapter 4, he starts applying that gospel and teaching us how it works itself out in our lives, in our daily living. He writes in Ephesians 4, 1, Therefore, that is, in light of all of this gospel truth and what Christ has done for you, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. That language about walking in a certain way is simply Paul's way of saying that as a follower of Jesus, Here's how you live everyday life. Walking is living. So to walk in a certain manner is to just live your everyday life in a particular manner. When Paul gets to Ephesians 5.15, he urges believers to walk carefully in both the world and in the church. And it's there that we learned how to walk carefully, namely walking in wisdom, walking in accordance to God's revealed will as we find it in the Bible, and walking in the Spirit, or being filled with the Spirit. From there, Paul shows us what it looks like to live wisely and to be Spirit-filled as a follower of Jesus in the various roles and relationships that we find ourselves in. That's what the household code is. Husbands, wives, sons, daughters, mothers, and fathers. And today, we will see what it looks like to be a spirit-filled servant, a spirit-filled master, and how we might apply that. So we'll look at each of those categories one at a time, beginning with spirit-filled servants. The initial command, it's right there at the beginning of verse 5, where Paul writes, bond servants, obey your earthly masters. Very literally, the verse reads, slaves, obey your masters according to the flesh. Initially, it may seem strange to see Paul addressing slaves in a household code right alongside husbands and wives and children and parents. But when we realize that approximately one-third of the population of Ephesus were slaves or bond servants, we begin to understand that the spread of the gospel throughout the region would have required Paul to address the slaves as many of them were coming to faith in Jesus. Moreover, the slaves, the bond servants, were very much considered a part of the household. They really were considered part of the family. So what initially seemed strange um, at first glance really isn't all that strange at all for the scenario in which Paul found himself. There is at least one sense, however, in which this would have looked strange to a first century audience. Back when we looked at Paul's instructions for spirit-filled marriage, we talked about how countercultural his instructions were. That's true of parents and children as well. He addressed women first in the household code. He commanded husbands to love their wives and emphasize that that's their most important function as a leader in the home. Again, in all the household codes in secular Greek, they're virtually missing the command to love your wives. All the other ones are there, but not love them. That's the main command for biblical leadership in the home for men. Talking about fathers not to provoke their children to anger, showing this tender, compassionate side of parenthood 
It's countercultural. This section of the household code is also countercultural because of the mere fact that he addresses slaves at all. Slaves were included in the community of faith, and Paul addressed them directly as valuable members of the body of Christ. That's huge. Now, again, the command Paul gives to Christian slaves is obey your earthly masters. You'll notice that this household code, it is placed in the context of submitting to earthly authority and leadership. Back in verse 21, Paul called all Christians to submit to one another in the fear of Christ, which is essentially Paul calling for us to submit to the authority that God has given to the local church. We submit to one another out of reverence for the Lord Jesus as we disciple one another in his church. Then he called for wives to submit to the leadership of their husbands as they submit to the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now we find him calling Christian slaves to obey their masters according to the flesh. This means that one aspect of what it means for us to walk carefully, to walk wisely in the world, to walk in the spirit, is for us to submit to the spheres of human authority in which we find ourselves as believers in Jesus. Paul calls for Christian slaves to obey their earthly masters, but then he helps us better understand what godly, Christ-like, wise, spirit-filled obedience looks like by providing several characteristics of the particular kind of obedience he's after for us in this passage. Not only will he help us understand what it looks like, Paul will also summarize the characteristics and give us the ultimate primary motivation for submission and obedience to earthly authority. So first, the characteristics of spirit-filled obedience among servants. First characteristic we see is this. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. The word fear is used frequently in our Bibles, but sometimes we don't even realize it because it's often rendered as respect or something along those lines in order to help us understand what the biblical author was trying to communicate. Confuses us as English-speaking readers to simply read the word fear because it takes a little extra work from the surrounding context to figure out precisely what's being called for. For instance, I don't believe that Paul is calling bond servants or slaves to fear their masters with some kind of paralyzing, dreadful fear. However, I'm also not fully persuaded he's merely calling for them to deeply respect their masters. He's doing that, but I believe Paul is thinking of fear and trembling primarily in a vertical sense, not a horizontal sense. We talked about that in 1 Peter. What does that mean? Fear and trembling as a characteristic of our obedience to earthly authority is ultimately directed vertically toward God, not horizontally toward man. The parallel household code we referenced, I think it was last week, in Colossians. Paul wrote that letter to uh, the Colossian believers. In chapters 3 and 4, he does a household code there as well. In chapter 3, verse 22, he writes, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Same command here in Ephesians. And then one of the qualifiers is this, fearing the Lord. Fearing the Lord. So, yes, bond servants were called to have a deep respect to earthly authority given to their masters, but they were ultimately called to obey that authority in the fear of Christ. Their obedience to human beings was to be lived out by standing in awe and in reverence of God himself. God is the one we ultimately fear, the one before whom we stand in awe with hearts filled with worship, which then in turn transforms the way in which we interact with those around us, including those who are in positions of power and authority. We fear God ultimately, and that leads us to then obey and respect the authority over us. The second character characteristic is this. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with a sincere heart. This is simply a way of Paul calling for servants to submit to the authority of their masters with pure motives, pure intentions. The opposite of a sincere heart is a deceitful heart, a heart that would serve and work with malicious motivations. By the Holy Spirit, 
under its inspiration, under his inspiration, I should say, when Paul addresses those who have been saved through faith in Christ, he addresses us as people who still struggle with sin. As people who must continually wage war on the sinful passions that remain in our flesh. Therefore, Paul will often give believers exhortations like this one because he knows that we have a tendency not to do it. As you might imagine, it would be easy for a slave to succumb to the temptation to obey an earthly master for a variety of reasons that would not demonstrate a sincere heart. Perhaps with a view toward obtaining an opportunity for retaliation, for vengeance, something of that nature. God was communicating through the Apostle Paul that he did not want these first century bondservants obeying their earthly masters with impure, evil motives, but rather with a sincere heart that has experienced the cleansing power of the gospel. The third characteristic is slaves, obey your earthly masters as you would obey Christ. This is the attitude that God desires to be characterized by all the relationships that we find in the household code as it pertains to the one called to live in submission to a higher authority. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters as you would obey the Lord Jesus. That is to say, obey your earthly master and serve him as though you are obeying Jesus directly, as though you are submitting to his authority. You have probably heard the saying about serving or living before an audience of one. The audience of God, that's the idea here. Slaves, obey your masters on earth as you would obey the master, your master, the Lord Jesus. Submit and obey to your master as a means of submitting and obeying to Jesus himself. The fourth characteristic is this. Slaves, obey your earthly masters not by way of eye service as people pleasers. This is very similar to obeying with a sincere heart to obeying earthly authority as a means of obeying Jesus. This is a call to examine the underlying motivation for our obedience. God called these first century followers of Christ who came to faith in Jesus as slaves to obey their masters such that they were not merely submitting to authority and walking in obedience when people were watching them. They were not to work and serve under the authority of their earthly master just to be noticed by men. They weren't called to work and serve for the applause or recognition of those around them. They were called, as we will see in a few seconds, to obey their earthly masters with a view toward pleasing God, not man. And that leads to the fifth characteristic of the slave's obedience. Paul writes in the latter half of verse 6, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters, as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. The saving work of the gospel has been shining throughout the characteristics of the slave's obedience. The Christian slave should obey their earthly master because they stand in awe of who Jesus is in the fear of Christ, standing in reverence before Jesus because he died to save us, because he's been raised from the dead, because of his great love for us and because of his great authority and power over everything, we stand in awe of him. They could obey their earthly master with a sincere heart because their heart has been cleansed and made new by the blood of Christ. And they could obey their master as a means of obeying Jesus directly with a view toward pleasing him rather than men doing the will of God from the heart because through faith in the gospel, these slaves of men were actually made slaves of Jesus. In his saving work, in his redemptive work, in his death and resurrection, Jesus Christ has done something that turns slaves into free men and free men into slaves. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7.22, For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. Jesus has accomplished a work that frees people, both slaves and people who aren't slaves, from the bondage 
of the greatest slavery, the thing that enslaves everyone, namely sin. But that freedom from sin is also described in Scripture as becoming the slave of the one who purchased us out of the slavery to sin, Jesus. We are freed from the power and penalty of sin through faith in him, not to become our own, not to gain ultimate independence to do whatever we want to do, but rather we are slave from the sl- saved from the slavery of sin in order to truly serve Jesus by delighting in him, by seeking him, by seeking his kingdom, by doing whatever it is he has called us to do and actually being empowered to do it and actually having our desires transformed such that we long to do it. We want to serve our king. The Christian who is a bond servant or a slave from an earthly perspective is ultimately free and yet at the same sense a slave to the Lord Jesus. Every Christian, regardless of his or her vocation, is a slave to Christ, a bond servant of Christ to do the will of God. Ephesians is all about helping us understand our true identity in Jesus Christ. Our ultimate identity as believers is not found in our earthly roles and responsibilities. It is found in this fact. Through faith in him, we are in Christ. You'll see that phrase over and over and over again in Ephesians. You are in Christ. Every Christian, everyone who has come to saving faith in Jesus has been bought or purchased by him with his own precious blood. And therefore, we ultimately belong to him. We are in him. That's our ultimate identity. After laying out all of these characteristics of spirit-filled obedience, Paul summarizes them very simply in verse 7, and then he gives an ultimate motivation for obeying earthly authority in verse 8. In summary, Paul writes, verse 7, Slaves, obey your earthly masters, rendering service, with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. That's the big picture given throughout those verses. Slaves are to work under the authority of their master with a view towards serving God, pleasing God, glorifying God, and obeying God. The ultimate focus is on the Lord, not men, neither the slave nor the master. The ultimate focus is on God who has ordained the earthly authority. Then after summarizing what he is after for these slaves, he gives the ultimate motivation for their obedience to earthly authority. Paul writes in verse 8 that bond servants are to obey their masters knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. The ultimate motivating factor underneath the work of a first century Christian slave was not what they would receive back for their obedience during their present earthly lives, but rather what they would receive from the Lord himself in the life to come. Whether one is a slave or a free man prior to their conversion, when they come to faith in Jesus, they become slaves of Christ and slaves of righteousness. Therefore, as slaves of Christ on earth, as those who were called to follow and serve Jesus with unwavering devotion and allegiance to him, these first century bond servants were called to serve their masters in this world with their eyes fixed on heaven and the age to come. I'm sure you've often heard the Christian cliche, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I understand what Christians mean when they use language like that, but the problem with it is this. The Bible teaches us that the way to do the most earthly good is by being as heavenly minded as possible. The ultimate fuel for the obedience of servants is that their God-glorifying, God-pleasing, God-exalting good work and their submission to earthly authority will be rewarded in heaven on the day that they stand before the judgment seat of Christ and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. They were called to serve and obey with a view toward obtaining a reward from Christ in heaven, not a reward on the earth. Now, we turn our attention to the shorter part of the passage, 
dealing with spirit-filled masters. Verse 9, Paul writes, Masters, do the same to them, your bondservants, and stop your threatening. The second aspect of the earthly master's behavior toward their bondservants is fairly easy to understand. As those who have placed their faith in Jesus, they were to stop threatening and abusing their servants. It was common practice for masters to treat their slaves in evil ways, in ways that abused their authority, in ways that both physically and emotionally harmed their bondservants. But here comes the gospel of Jesus Christ into the Greco-Roman world, into this area of Ephesus where 33% of the population were slaves from all walks of life. And these slave owners, just like the slaves, were coming to faith in Jesus. They were hearing the good news of Christ, that there is forgiveness of sin in him, that we can be made right with God through faith in him. They were coming to faith, and as we know, faith in Jesus brings radical changes to the lives of believers. And that radical change is not limited to those who are weak and powerless in terms of their position in the world, like slaves. The gospel also radically changes those with great power and authority, like those who own slaves or bond servants. And as a result, they were to put off the culturally accepted practices of verbally and physically abusing their slaves and to put on the Lord Jesus and the ways in which he would have them to walk. It's the first command that Paul gives to earthly masters in the first half of verse 9 that's a little difficult to figure out. Paul simply writes, Masters, Do the same to them. Do the same to your bondservants. Well, he just spent four verses discussing slaves during which he gave five characteristics of their obedience, summarized those characteristics, gave the theology or the motivation that was to undergird and fuel that obedience. There's a lot there. And he just says, do the same to them. What? Do the same what? So in light of all that information, how exactly are masters to do the same to slaves? I highly doubt Paul is saying, masters, obey your slaves, or something like that. There's not an exact correspondence here. However, the summary statement from verse 7 and the motivation in verse 8 helps us to see what Paul might have been getting at here. Masters were to render their service and exercise their authority with a good will and a view towards serving and pleasing Christ, not man. Biblically speaking, this is true for all Christians. Therefore, it is equally applicable to the slave master as it is to the slave himself. Moreover, they were to exercise their authority and to do good unto their servants, understanding that they would one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the works they had done in the body, whether good or bad. Earthly masters who believe in Jesus and follow him, just like every other follower of Jesus, would one day stand before the judge of the universe. Therefore, aiming to please Christ and to receive a heavenly reward from him is the ultimate way to ensure that you are rendering service and exercising the authority you've been given in ways that honor and glorify God and and do good to people. Paul goes on in the second half of verse 9 to give the ground or the motivation that would spur these earthly masters on to this spirit-filled behavior to which he is calling them. And it is essentially a repetition of what we just discussed. Masters are to do good, to do the same to their servants, to stop threatening them, knowing that he who is both their master, the bondservant's master, and theirs in heaven is reigning with all authority, that he is the ultimate master, and with him, there's no partiality. The bondservant of an earthly master, who was a believer in Jesus, became a slave of Christ and a slave of righteousness. Likewise, the earthly master, who was the slave to no one on earth, became the slave of Jesus when he came to faith became a slave of righteousness when they came to faith in the gospel. Both the bondservant and the earthly master, they both have a heavenly master. And that master is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He reigns as Lord over both the slave and the free. He calls them both to live in ways which please him and to relate to one another in ways that glorify him and display his love to the watching world. 
More than that, this master in heaven who reigns over both the slave and the free man sees them both as slaves of Christ and nothing else. Their ultimate identity is not bondservant or earthly master, but rather slave of Christ. They belong to the same community. They both belong to the people of God. There's no partiality with the master because both the slave and the free man who know him through faith in Jesus are both equally a part of Christ's body. They are both equally sons and daughters of the living God. This is why the Apostle Paul can write in Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is no male, there is no female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Before God, we're one. Those distinctions serve a purpose on earth and in God's design, but as we stand before God as believers, we all stand equal before him in value, in dignity, in worth, and in purpose. Every believer is one in Christ, having been united to Christ and his people through faith. Now, before we close with some brief application work, just as I did the last time we preached on a text like this, I think it was February of 2016, we were in 1 Timothy, I want to answer a question that is probably in your minds. Uh, I think it may rise in our minds every time we read a text about slavery in the New Testament. We ask ourselves, why didn't the Apostle Paul address the moral ramifications of slavery? Why did he address how the slaves or bond servants of his day were to relate to their earthly masters and vice versa without dealing with the issue of slavery itself? Why didn't he explicitly denounce slavery as being wrong and sinful as an institution? Those are really good questions if you're asking them. And as quickly as I can, I want to give you once more the answers that I gave to those questions a year and a half ago. Um, You may remember some of them. Quickly, four things uh, related to this issue that might help us understand these texts about slavery when we come to them. Why Paul didn't just simply denounce slavery in the text and deal with the morality of it. First, one of the main reasons that questions like these arise in our minds is because we tend to equate the first century Greco-Roman slavery we read about in the New Testament with the transatlantic slave trade that took place from the 15th to the 19th century. Simply equating these two types of slavery is probably not the most helpful thing that we can do as we wrestle with these things. In the New Testament passages that deal with slavery, especially Ephesians 6, Philemon 12 through 16, we see the apostle lay out principles that paint a different picture of the slave-master relationship than what we would see in the transatlantic slave trade, as well as principles which work to essentially destroy the institution of slavery from the inside out. In this morning's text, the Apostle Paul exhorted slaves to obey their earthly masters as they obey Christ, to render their servants as they render it to Jesus directly, knowing they'll be rewarded on the last day. Something we'll come back to in just a second, but also we find these gospel-centered instructions are given to the masters as well, and they are given in such a way that they completely transform the very relationship of the slave, the slave has with the master. The gospel-infused slave-master relationship that we find in the Bible is very different from viewing men, women, and children as merely being personal property and subjecting them to inhumane treatment based on the color of their skin. The African slave trade may have started for economic reasons, but it very quickly morphed into the monster that created and fueled intense bigotry and racism that has lasted for so many years, even in our own country, even amongst those who have professed faith in Christ. So I'm not saying there are not similarities. There certainly are similarities to slavery in the first century and the slavery that we're familiar with seeing in movies and that has gone on in our country. There are similarities, but it is unhelpful to just simply equate them as though they're exactly the same. There are very major differences, though there are similarities. Secondly, 
Paul exhorting Christian bond servants and Christian masters about how they should relate to one another without explicitly denouncing the institution of slavery itself does not mean that Paul was condoning slavery. In fact, you can argue, you can make an argument from 1 Timothy 1.10 that Paul did explicitly condemn chattel slavery, the type of slavery that forced men and women to become someone's property. In 1 Timothy 1, the Apostle Paul taught that the Old Testament law was laid down not for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient. And then he expounded what the lawless and disobedient look like. The law is laid down for the unholy, for the profane, for the sexually immoral, for those who strike their father and mother, so on and so forth. Well, among the list for whom the law is laid down, we find a group of people that our English Standard Version translates as enslavers. New King James Version has it as men stealers. New American Standard, kidnappers. The NIV, helpful here, slave traders. The Greek underneath the ESV rendering of enslavers is a word used to describe someone who would take someone captive with the intention of selling them into slavery. Therefore, one can argue that Paul did explicitly condemn slavery as a sinful institution, as being something for which the law was laid down to reveal as ultimately sinful. The fact that Paul doesn't explicitly denounce slavery as an institution in Ephesians 6 should not be taken as a silent endorsement of slavery. Third, while Paul's general instructions for bond servants or slaves in the Bible exhort them to honor their masters, submit to their authority, and serve them well, Paul does elsewhere explicitly instruct bond servants to obtain their freedom if the opportunity presents it. 1 Corinthians 7.21, Paul writes, Were you a bond servant or a slave when called to the Lord? Do not be concerned about that, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. So Paul didn't teach that slaves who became Christians were just stuck in the institution of slavery, just suck it up and be a slave, so to speak, for the rest of their lives. He wasn't teaching that it was a good thing for them to be slaves. He taught Christians to faithfully serve and follow Jesus in whatever circumstance or situation they found themselves in when they came to faith in Christ, including Christian slaves. But those same Christian slaves, they were encouraged to obtain their freedom if they could. Fourth, and I think the most important, the fundamental reason that Paul did not explicitly denounce the institution of slavery in Scripture or campaign for the abolition of slavery was because his greatest concern was not for the immediate transformation of the Greco-Roman society in which he lived, but the transformation of the human heart. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't seek the transformation of society by ridding it of evil, sinful practices like slavery. In the providence of God, we live in a society that makes such a thing possible. We live in a representative republic. As citizens of our country, we play a vital role in the government and in the passing of our nation's laws. The Apostle Paul did not have that luxury. Paul wasn't going to change or transform the evil, sinful structures of his society in the Greco-Roman world by simply denouncing them as evil and campaigning against them. That would have been a, a very quick way to end his ministry and not preach the gospel. Rather, he attacked the immoral, sinful institution of slavery at its foundation. He allowed himself to be consumed by the ultimate need of his day. The ultimate problem in the universe is not the evil sinful practices that emerge in society. The ultimate problem is the evil sinful creatures, us, who create the sinful practices. Paul's greatest concern was the glory of Jesus and the mission that Jesus gave to the church. His greatest concern was not first and foremost the reformation of society, but the transformation of the human heart, the transformation of the individual who made up the society. He prioritized preaching the gospel and seeing God convert the individual sinners who made up the culture over revolting against the particular political or sociological structures of his day. Therefore, we should not view the Apostle Paul as condoning or endorsing slavery simply because he didn't address 
the morality of it in Ephesians 6. First century slavery, though there were indeed similarities, was not the mere equivalent of the African slave trade. He did explicitly identify enslavers as being lawless and disobedient before God. He exhorted Christian slaves to obtain their freedom if they could. And he was most concerned with preaching the gospel and seeing the human heart transformed by the grace of God, not transforming the fallen society in which he found himself. The preaching of the gospel and the transformation of the human heart is the ultimate way to transform society. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and its power to forgive sinners, to make us right with God, to make us new, to give us new desires, to follow God and his will as we find it in the Bible. The power of the gospel, the proclamation of it, is what brings true and lasting reformation to individuals. That's the way you transform society as a whole. You change the hearts of the individuals in the society. And that was Paul's focus. Very, very quickly, I want to close our time by making uh, an effort at applying this to our lives today as followers of Jesus in 21st century America. We're not slaves. Not in this sense. We are not the personal property of another human being. However, when you walk through this text, linger over it for a little bit, it doesn't take us too long to see how this might apply to our lives today in America. I believe the characteristics of obedience in verses 5 through 8 and the way those in leadership are called to exercise their authority in verse 9 are applicable to us today as both laborers and leaders. As Christians who find ourselves living out our faith in a wide variety of settings, we are called to perform our work by rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Ephesians 6, 7. We are to carry out our labor as slaves of Christ. We are called to work in the fear of Christ knowing that since we've been united to Jesus by faith, since we've been set apart for Him and His purposes, everything that we do Everything that we are called to do, everything that is done in the realm of earth is ultimately done in the realm of what is holy. There's not a distinction for us between sacred and secular as Christians. For the Christian, for the person who has been sanctified, set apart for Christ in the world, everything that you do is holy because it's all for him because you belong to him. You're in him. He's with you as you do it. Everything we do, whether it's taking a test in school or driving a truck or diagnosing illnesses or stocking the shelf at the supermarket, changing oil, drawing blueprints, feeding children, mopping floors, filling cavities, teaching students, everything that you do as a follower of Jesus is to be done ultimately for the glory of Jesus and for the good of people. Every single vocation that exists on the planet, exists for Jesus' sake, for his glory. And we are to do our work as unto him because he is the one before whom we will give an account on the last day. Our jobs exist as a means of glorifying him and as a means of accomplishing the mission he has given us, namely to proclaim the gospel and make disciples. The same is true of the positions of earthly authority that we find in the labor force. The Christian who has been raised up to a position of earthly authority over others, like the earthly master of Ephesians 6-9, is called to exercise the authority that he or she has been given in order to do good unto other people, to glorify Jesus and to live for the reward of God. Of Christ in the age to come. Therefore, if you are following Jesus as one who is a supervisor at work, a manager, a director, something of that nature, you are a person who has been entrusted to exercise authority over other people by making important decisions on their behalf or rewarding them or supervising, oversight, discipline of them, reward, whatever. If you have been entrusted with authority You are called by the word of God to remember that you too have someone in authority over you in heaven. That you have a master in heaven 
That while, yes, you have been given authority on earth, there is also someone who is ultimately in authority over you and everyone else in heaven. And his name is Jesus. Moreover, there is coming a day on which you will stand before him and give an account for how you wielded your authority that you've been given in your vocation. God is calling you and has raised you up and given you earthly authority as a platform for his glory. God is calling you to use the authority that you have for the good of those under your watch, to exercise your authority in such a way that it points to Jesus and his goodness, the way he graciously and justly and lovingly exercises his authority over his people, to exercise your authority not with a view toward temporal earthly realities, though that's certainly part of what we do in our jobs, they're filled with temporal earthly realities. But our ultimate focus is with a view toward eternal heavenly realities. For us as followers of Jesus, whether you find yourself in a servant-like role or in a role in which you exercise authority over others, the goal for both is the same. To serve, to work, and to exercise authority with a view toward hearing Jesus say to us on the last day, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. So by God's grace, by God's power, let us do our work on this earth, whether our positions are at work are high or low. Let us do our work with our eyes fixed on our master in heaven.